Good evening, everyone. If you haven't had a chance yet, why don't you go ahead and turn to someone to your right or to your left and, and wish them a, a good evening as well, maybe even a pat on the back, a shoulder squeeze. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we are so glad that you have decided to invest your time to be here. Uh, this Bible study seminar, it began last night, will continue throughout the week. We are so excited to have Ty Gibson here with us. Uh, I have been blessed. If you were here last night, I'm sure you were blessed as well. In fact, one of the things that Ty shared last night is that God's love has a gravitational pull. And whether you know it or not, you are here as a result of God's love drawing you. And, uh, and so praise the Lord that uh, you have found it in your heart to not resist that draw, that gravitational pull tonight. And so we are again, uh, we're anticipating the opportunity to open up the Bible, to see a revelation of God's character that maybe we haven't seen before or that we needed to be reminded of tonight. And so welcome once again to this place. Let's bow our heads as we, as we begin. Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that you join us here this evening. Um, give us understanding of your word. Uh, be with Ty. Give him clarity as he shares with us. And Lord, more than anything, help us to learn a little bit more about you tonight. Thank you so much for the opportunity to learn and to study in the pages of scripture. And Lord, we just ask that you guide us tonight. Is our prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone. First of all, just want to make sure that everybody has an outline titled Ancient Love. Um, there was a little bit of confusion at that door, which was Pastor Jamie's fault, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the wrong outline was being, you should not have the outline called Nameless Tears. That's from last night. That's also available. If you were not here, you can collect that one. It's a little library of outlines that you'll be able to accumulate, put in a folder, and Never look at it again if you want, or maybe you will want to look at it again. But you need to have ancient love. Raise your hand if you do not have ancient love. Oh, look at all these people over here, Jamie, without ancient love. Some of them, some of them need some ancient love. Yes. Well, this evening, I want to begin our time together um, by taking you to a place, taking you, in fact, to what for me is literally the most beautiful place I've ever been, with no even close second, the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. Uh, my wife and I and our three children, we were on a tropical island, and the island was great, but it was getting kind of boring, because my wife is the kind of girl who likes to lay on tropical beaches, sipping fruity drinks. <laughs> she calls it resting sipping fruity drinks and reading books. Well, I can do that for like 12 minutes. And I begin pacing the beach, jumping in the water, getting out of the water, jumping in the water, getting out of the water. And a group of about seven little kids, one of whom we happen to know his family. These little kids saw my predicament and they had mercy on me. They surrounded me on the beach and they said, do you want us to take you to the coolest place on the island? And I said, yes, where is it? And they said, come on. And I begin following these little kids off the beach, off the sand, up this dirt road until we finally came to a huge open mouth cave. And I mean, it was massive. And I looked down into that dark cave and the little boy who was the leader of the pack said, we're going in there. And I thought for a minute, no, you're going in there. I'm not going in that dark cave. But they just took off down into the dark cave. And I thought, oh, man, I'm a grown man. I need to follow. So I went down, and I could see them. I could see them, and then suddenly I couldn't see them. And it's getting darker and darker as I go deeper into this cave. Until finally I can't see them at all, and I just hear the gravel under their feet. Now, I can't see anything. I just have to listen to find my way. And suddenly, the gravelly sound under their feet stopped. And I thought, oh, no, they're going to mug me. <laughs> right here in the cave, they're going to mug me. And then I thought, they're not going to mug me. All I have is my shorts. <laughs> There's nothing to take. Their feet were making the sound, and then the sound stopped. And then, as I stood there in the silence of that dark cave, 
one of the little boys said, listen to this. And I heard their little hands, all of their little hands, grabbing up the gravel and the rocks and throwing it forward, apparently. And then I heard the gravel plopping in the water that was apparently in the dark right in front of us. And then the little leader of the group said, now we're getting in. And again, I thought in my mind, no, you're getting in that dark water, I'm not. And I heard their little bodies splash one after another, and they're in the water. So I walk up until I feel my toes touching water and dive in. And then I hear them swimming, swimming. I can hear their hands, I can hear their feet swimming, swimming. And so I begin swimming, and then all of a sudden, that sound stops. And they're silencing. So I stop, and I'm just treading water, and all of a sudden I hear the little hand slapping what sounds like a wet stone wall. So I come forward a little bit, and sure enough, there's water, and there's a, there's a wall in front of me. And then the little boy, the insane one, says, can you hold your breath? I said, yes. He said, really, really, really for a long time? I thought, no, <laughs> but yes. And he said, because now you know what we're going to do? It was downright sadistic, the sound in his voice. You know what we're going to do now? He said, we're going to take a deep breath. We're going to go under, and we're going to swim under the rock wall. And now I'm really thinking, no way am I going to do that. But suddenly, I hear them all take a breath, and they're gone. I think, oh, no. So in a moment of panic, I took a deep breath. I went under, feeling the wall, feeling the wall. Finally, there's a ceiling, and I go under. And I begin swimming as fast as I can in the forward direction into the darkness under this rock ceiling. The feelings of claustrophobia are increasing as I'm paddling. And then suddenly, suddenly, as I'm swimming, for all I'm worth, I start to see something. And it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And then I see all of these little kids treading water. And I come up for a gasp of air. And all of them are laughing their heads off. And I find myself with these little kids in an underwater cave that has an opening at the top. It's just the right time of day. And they knew it was going to be the right time of day. And the sun is shining in, refracting with the light off the walls in the pure water. And all of our bodies in the crystal clear water are kind of shimmering and shining an iridescent blue. And the little boy who's the leader of the pack says, it's the blue room. <gasps> Takes a deep breath, goes under, and they all left me alone in the underwater cave. And there I was in the most beautiful place I've ever been on planet Earth. The most beautiful place. But I want to tell you something about that beautiful place. What made it beautiful as I just treaded water there in this cave all alone in the silence and all the children were gone now, what really blew my mind is that not only was the place beautiful, but everybody who goes there is beautiful, shining in the light in that beautiful, beautiful, iridescent, shimmering blue color. But there was something even more beautiful. As soon as I was alone there, I thought, wow, the incredible thing about this place is the children and the joy they experienced in taking me there. And it dawned on me that we, as human beings, are fundamentally social creatures. We look out of our eyes into other people's eyes and we look for response. We laugh because we want people to laugh with us. We sing songs because we want people to hear them and to be elated with the lyrics and feel like they're in that moment with us. We have conversations 
because we want people to understand us. We want to be understood and we want to understand. We're fundamentally social creatures. And I've discovered over the years that we as human beings are most beautiful in friendships. There's an incredible philosophical idea that has been developed down through the last three or four centuries regarding friendship. And even though it's a, it's a philosophical idea, everybody here has experienced it. If you get together with any group of friends, you will see aspects of their personalities that you never see unless you're in the group. Are you tracking with me? If it's just you and him, just the two of you, you and your buddy from high school, it's good. You're friends. You've known each other for a long time. But then there's that other guy. And whenever he comes into the mix, you see beautiful things in your buddy's personality that only that guy can bring out. Have you noticed that? I've noticed it even in marriage. I love my wife. She's incredible. I have discovered things about her through all these years we've been together. We've been together since she was 13 and I was 14. Discovery after discovery, one moment after another, I'm just blown. Wow, so that's going on inside of you. You're like that. You're, um, you're more beautiful than I ever imagined. But check this out. I see my wife through my eyes. I see her alone. Are you with me? But when I see my wife with our daughters, with our son, they bring out beauties in her personality that I never see unless they're present. We're fundamentally social creatures. And I have a question for you and with you tonight. Why are we like this? Why are we so passionately desirous of connection with others. And why is it that we are most beautiful as human beings when we are engaged in friendship? Well, I want to take you on a journey tonight to discover the origin of this dimension of what it means to be human. Now, to do this, we're going to begin with Psalm 90, verse 2. It's in your outline if you want to take notes and circle some of the key words. Take some notes in the margin. But this is a phenomenal insight in Scripture that if we can really process it and take it in, it will change our perception of God, of ourselves, and others. We're in for some extremely delightful paradigm shifts this evening. Scripture says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world. Pause right there. This is the psalmist addressing God in a song, in a prayer song. He's singing out to God, addressing God and saying, hey God, before, before creation, before you made mountains and before you formed the world, before anything was made, notice these words, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, that's an odd terminology, isn't it? We don't think in those terms as human beings. From everlasting to everlasting. We think from yesterday to today and maybe tomorrow. We're time-bound creatures. All we understand are the parameters of time. But here in Scripture, there is something called everlasting to everlasting. That's quite an expanse, wouldn't you say? We could articulate it like this, that all of reality from a biblical standpoint can be divided into two basic parts, what we could call eternity past, and then what do you think? Eternity future. Eternity past and eternity future. And then somewhere along the way, there's something that we call creation. Are you tracking with me so far? Now, the illustration is depicted with arrows because if we, at this point, creation, we're a part of creation, according to the biblical storyline, and because we're a part of creation, 
we are what are called contingent creatures. We are bound by time and space, and therefore we are not by nature the kinds of creatures that can even begin to comprehend what it might mean to have always existed. In fact, if you just think about the idea of a being, a supreme being of God, having, listen to the words, having always existed, it's beyond our comprehension because all we understand is succession. One event following another, following another, following another. And because of that, because we're creatures of time and space, our mental hard drive begins to wobble and smoke starts coming out of our ears if we try to think of what it might mean to have always existed in some realm of reality called eternity past. There's another scripture in the book of Isaiah that says that God inhabits eternity, not time, but eternity. Now, it's beyond our comprehension. We don't know what that means. It's outside of our time-space understanding of reality to grasp what it means. It's outside of the realm of our intellectual orbit. But let's just try for a minute. Let's go back as far as we can. From the point that we're calling creation, let's go back, back, back in a simple exercise of our minds, okay? All of us have a birth date. That means that there was the day that we exited the womb into the world, right? Are you with me so far? Now, if you go back nine months and two days before that, before conception occurred in your mother's womb, you had no existence whatsoever anywhere in all of reality. You didn't exist. But your mom and dad, they have birth dates. They're created beings, so you could go back a little bit further and realize, hey, wait a minute. If we go back just a little further, my mom and dad didn't exist at some point. But just keep on moving back, back, back in time. Day after day, week, month, year, decade, century after century. And you realize, hey, for example, there was a time when there was no such thing, would you agree, when there was no such thing as the United States of America, yes or no? Yeah, I've actually, my wife and I have shopped at a toy store in London that has been in continuous operation since before George Washington was born. A toy store. We ate in a restaurant in France that has been in continual operation before the pilgrims got to the United States of America and began settling. A restaurant. The food was great. The United States is a rather young nation. You don't have to go back too far, and there's no such thing as the United States of America. Am I right? But then just keep going back in time, drawing on all the information you have at your disposal, all you know of history, all you've ever read, all you've ever heard, all the programs you've watched on the History Channel. Go back, 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 and you'll come to a time when there's no such thing as a Roman Empire, no such thing as Greece. Come to a time before Socrates. You'll come to a time before Egypt. You'll come to a time, if you go back in history, when all there is is the Babylonian Empire and Mesopotamia, and then you just go back a few years before that, and none of that's there either. Until you come face-to-face -face in the biblical narrative with the first man and the first woman. What are their names again? Adam and Eve. And right there, in Genesis, God created the first man and the first woman, and all you have to do is go back one day before he did that, and there's not a solitary human being anywhere in the universe. But then according to the biblical narrative, there's a group of, what shall we call them, beings, creatures, that predate the creation of human beings. Because according to Job, the book of Job, chapter 38, when God created planet Earth and the human race, all the sons of God and the stars of God shouted for joy. And if they shouted for joy at our creation, that means they were there as spectators to watch our creation. Are you tracking with me? Which means whoever these beings are, they predate humanity. They existed by God's 
creation before we existed. Let's call them the angels. That's what the Bible calls them. And the angels number, oh, there are so many of them. According to Daniel chapter 7, there are 10,000 times 10,000, which is 100 million, and thousands upon thousands. According to the book of Hebrews, there are an innumerable company of angels, innumerable. According to Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, every single child from birth is attended by a guardian angel. And there are, last I checked, 7.4 billion people on the planet, all attended by a guardian angel. Let's just say there are heaps and heaps, piles and piles of angels. And all of those angels are created beings, which means there was a point at which they began to exist. Are you with me? Which means all you have to do is go back in time one little baby step before the first angel was created, and there are no angels anywhere in the universe. And still, you have what the Bible calls all of eternity past. You're face to face with the sublime reality of God and God alone. God alone being the creator, the self-existent one, who never came into being but always was, is in a category by himself. And then there's everything else. You, me, angels, squirrels, platypuses, everything else. Everything else had a point of what? Beginning. Everything that is but God. So when we're face to face with God and God alone, what in fact are we face to face with? What, in fact, are we beginning to comprehend? Well, let's throw a few more before scriptures on the table. You remember Psalm 90 that we just read? Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had ever made the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Note the word before. And here again in the New Testament, Colossians 1, verse 17. In your outline, circle the word before. Before all things, he is before all things, and in him all things consist or hold together or cohere. He's before how many things? All things. God predates everything. That's what this scripture is saying. He alone inhabits eternity past. But check this out. Circle in your outline the word before in Titus 1 and verse 2. Before time began. So apparently, as hard as it is for us to comprehend this, there is what we might refer to, according to the Bible, as a non-time region of reality. Are you tracking with me? Is that a bit much? It's a bit much. A non-time region of reality. A part of reality called eternity past where there is no ticking seconds, minutes, hours, weeks, months going by. There is some kind of, I don't know, what did Paul Tillich call it based on his study of Plato? He called it the eternal now. God occupies the eternal present. And everywhere God is, is the present. Everywhere for God is now, now, now. And you and I, we're just these, these, these small, piddly little creatures that undergo a succession of minutes and hours and days and months and years. And as small as we are, as insignificant as we are in our own estimation, Scripture comes along and says, you are so small, so, so tiny, so small, and so huge in God's estimation. So small and yet infinitely loved by a God who would rather die than live without you. So the biblical storyline is telling us that God existed for all eternity past, and so Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, you see on the screen the wrong text there, but 
in your outline, you'll have Daniel 7, verse 9. There are going to be a couple typos because my wife didn't proofread these. It's going to be all right. You're going to be okay. All right, so in Daniel 7, verse 9, check this out. Daniel is thinking about God and calls God the ancient of days. The what? Ancient of days. That sounds like time talk, right? So if I ask you, based on this scripture, if I ask you, hey, 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 based on the Bible, is God old? What are you going to say? Uh, yeah, apparently. Very old. God's old. Ancient, in fact. But what if in the next breath I ask you, okay, okay, God's old, but is God elderly? I mean, does he have his teeth in a jar by the bed? Is his hairline receding? Does he have a pain in his left knee that is getting more and more aggravating as the zillions of years go by? Is God subject to entropy? Think about it this way. If God is eternal, and Scripture says that God is, God has always existed, and therefore God is very old. God is ancient, in fact. God is really, 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 totally, really, really, totally old. And yet, simultaneously, God is really, really young. If God were to do that thing that we do sometimes, that little, that little thing that some of us do, hey, hey, guess my age. We, by the way, we stop doing that once we're 40. It's not fun after that, and it's not funny after that. And if anybody tries to guess our age without our permission, we leave the room. But we do that sometimes. Hey, guess how old I am. I mean, if you've really been exercising and eating a lot of blueberries, you'll play that game. Guess how old I am. And we're expecting, what are we hoping for? You know, we want them to guess that we're way younger than we actually are so that we can believe the lie ourselves and wear the shirt that says 29 and holding a little bit longer. So what if God were to play that game with us? What if God were to show up right now, just hypothetically, right, based on this scripture, the ancient of days? What if God were to show up right now and just by appearance say, hey, ignore everything you know about the fact that I'm eternal, and just from appearances, take a guess. How old am I? Um, I don't know, 22? 25 max? Now, I don't know what kind of image you have in your head of God, but God is not subject to the aging process. Entropy has no power over him. God doesn't get old. His hairline is not receding, and his teeth are not in a jar by the bed. God is very young and always has been. But check this out. I love this from G.K. Well, this one's from George MacDonald. George MacDonald, anybody with a beard like that speaks wisdom. And he says, check this out. Just wrap your mind around the beauty of this. God was, is, and ever shall be divinely childlike. Childhood belongs to the divine nature. I want you just to pause right now for a minute and think of God, the ancient of days, the one who inhabits all of eternity past. Think of God as childlike for a moment. G.K. Chesterton says it this way. We, human beings, we have sinned and grown old. And our Father, that's God, is younger than we are. This is a poetic way of saying that sin, evil, subjects us to a process of aging, but that if sin were removed from the human equation, none of us would age. We would always be young, and God, in fact, who is sinless, who is perfect innocence, is eternally young. Jesus came into the world and he said, if you're going to be a part of my kingdom, you have to become like children. It's the only way to get in. That was his way of not saying you need to become super immature and idiotic like all of our kids are. That was his way of saying you need to become like children 
in innocence. Wouldn't you love to be the kind of person for whom it's impossible to witness any violation of any human being and not feel pain in your soul? Wouldn't you like to be that sensitive? So sensitive that it would be impossible to witness anything bad without hurting inside. Well, think of God in those terms. God is infinitely innocent. God is infinitely young. God is beautifully in his 20s forever. And God, according to Scripture, has been engaged in doing something for all of eternity past. So let's pose the provocative question this evening. If God existed before all of creation, and Scripture says that he did, we might ask the question, what was God doing for all eternity past before creation? I mean, it's a legit question. I mean, we live short lives and we get bored. What was God doing forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever in the past? Was he pacing the universe, twiddling his thumbs? Before we existed, was God bored? Let's ask the question of Scripture. If God alone inhabits eternity past, before any of us were made, before the angels were made, before any of creation existed, let's ask the question, what was God up to? What was God doing? Now, the first clue is in the opening line of the Bible. In your outline, I want to ask you to take a note here. Circle the word God when the Bible opens in its initial sentence by saying, in the beginning, God, and I put dot, dot, dot. Because what comes after that? Creation. In the beginning, God created, but, but we're trying right now to comprehend before creation. We're attempting to paint what we might call a, it's a strange word, but put it in your notes, in your margin there, write the word pre, P-R-E, dash, creation. We're aiming right now for a pre-creation picture of God, a pre-creation comprehension of God. What was God doing before creation? Well, the scripture says, in the beginning, God. Before creation, all there was was God. Now, in the English, in the English, we just have the word God, and it's a rather generic word. That would be like me coming here on the first evening and, uh, and Jamie uh, standing up and saying, hey, I want to I introduce to you our speaker, this is human. <laughs> it's generic like that. God, in the beginning, God, human. What are you waiting for? Well, a name. Because, yes, I am human, but I'm a very specific human, as are you, and therefore, I have a name that identifies me, that distinguishes me apart from the other humans, yes or no? So you want to hear the name. Uh, this guy who's going to be speaking to us this evening, his name is Ty. I would introduce myself to you on our first encounter. Pleased to meet you, I'm Ty. Not pleased to meet you, I'm human. That just sounds weird. Don't do that to people, okay? Pleased to meet you, I'm Ty, all right? So the word is not God in the original language at all. That's just a really poor translation, very poor translation. It is the name Elohim, Elohim. It's a name. It's actually a plural noun, a plural noun, which is kind of strange if you think about it, because that would be like me introducing myself to you tonight and saying, pleased to meet you, I'm Ties, plural. And automatically, you would be thinking, one of two things are going on here. Either English is his second language and he just slaughtered it, or, honey, I think he thinks there's more than one of him. Let's get him some help, <laughs> right? Those are the options. But you would not take serious a plural introduction of myself, would you? Pleased to meet you, I'm Ties. What, what does that mean? Well, it's incoherent. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I do have a plural name, because Ty, singular, is married to a girl named Sue, singular. We did that whole procreation thing, and we have three children, Amber, Jason, and Leah. 
together as a group or what we call a family unit. Are you still with me? We're the Gibsons, plural. And now you're not struggling at all. That's a name, but it's a plural name that applies to the group, that applies to the family. Elohim is a plural noun in the Hebrew. It is the family name of God. It is the name by which God is first identified in Scripture to give us the clue, to clue us in on the fact that God is one and yet more than one. Are you still with me? Okay, let's go a step further. So if you skip down in Genesis 1, we're up in chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, Elohim, plural noun, weird. Then we come down to verses 26 and 27, and notice the language. Then God said, what do you think the word God there is there in the Hebrew? Take a guess. Elohim, you're right. Then Elohim said, notice the language, let us make man in our image. In our image? After our likeness. So God, verse 27, created man in his own image, in the image of God, in the image of Elohim, he created him, male and female, he created, what's that last word? Them. Circle the word them in your outline. God is an us, therefore his image is a them. God is having a conversation here. Let us make man in our image. Who is speaking to whom? Well, God is having a conversation with someone. It's an invitation to do something. Hey, let us do something. Let us make man in our image. Who's us? Who's our? Well, God is not speaking to human beings because they are the subject of the sentence, of the conversation, right? They don't exist yet. So the us and the our is not God and humans. Humans don't exist. It's not God speaking to angels. Hey, let us, God and angels, create. Why? Because angels aren't creators. They don't possess the power to create. So this is fascinating. Let us make man in our image. God, Elohim, is more than one in the first chapter of the Bible. There is some kind of relational dynamic that is going on here. Because when the image of God is finally created, notice, notice carefully, you guys, that the image of God is not the man, and the image of God is not the woman. The image of God is the man and the woman. A social unit. Two who are one, with the power to procreate and to expand their social circle in family units. This is the image of God. And what the Bible is telling us in this introductory chapter to the story is simply, as 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Now just pause with me for a minute to unpack this word love. When the Bible says God is love, here's what it means. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 5, that's what's sometimes called the love chapter. You remember that? Love is patient. Love is kind. And it goes on describing various attributes of love, right? Well, notice this part. In verses 4 and 5, it says love is not something. What is love not? Well, it's not, it doesn't seek its own. The New International Version says here, love is not self-seeking. So, so are you tracking with me? It's a negative grammatical formulation. Love is not something. It's not self-seeking. So if you were to just form a positive grammar, what would that sound like? If love is not self-seeking, what is love? It's other-centered. It's self-giving. If love is not self-seeking, it's other-seeking. Love, by its very nature, listen, love by its very nature is focused which way? Inward or outward? Outward. Therefore, 
in order for love to exist at any given moment, there must be more than one. Are you still with me? Or put it this way, you cannot go into the bathroom, lock the door, and stay there for the rest of your life and experience any love, even if you have a full-length mirror. <laughs> That's called narcissism. The only way to experience any love is to open the door and what? Come out of the bathroom and have relationships. Love cannot occur in isolation. So if the Bible tells us God is love, what does that tell us about God? God is a relationship of some kind. There must be, God is not a solitary self. God is both self and other simultaneously. God's a relational unit. God's a community. God is a relationship, a friendship of some sort. Now check this out. The Bible has this concept that we can refer to as the oneness of God. The oneness of God. And we find this in what is called the Shema. I don't know if we have any, any friends here this evening that are Jewish, but if you're Jewish, you know about the Shema. For thousands of years in Jewish synagogues, it's the most beautiful thing imaginable. In Jewish synagogues for thousands of years, since Moses wrote these words to this day, to this day on Shabbat, Sabbath, in Jewish synagogues around this country and around the world, these words were uttered in unison this very day in Jewish synagogues around the world. Here are the words that are spoken every Shabbat, every Sabbath, by the Hebrew people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is what? One. The Lord is one. Now, you need to understand something about this word one. There are two Hebrew words for one. Yakid, which is a Hebrew word for one that simply means singularity or numeric one. Like I'm holding up how many fingers right now? One, okay? Or solitary item, one finger, one. Are you still with me? But there's another Hebrew word for one, and it's ikad. And ikad is a word that our equivalent in English would be something like unity or harmony. The word ikad is more like oneness, not one, but oneness of several parts. A ballpoint pen has three essential parts that operate together to create the function of a pen. That kind of one. It's one pen, but it has several parts that together function, and that oneness of several parts is a kind of harmony, or what we would call a compound unity. Are you still with me? Am I confusing you? So, check this out. When Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Shema says, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, take a guess, take a guess, which Hebrew word is it for one that is used? Is it yakid, singularity, or ikad, compound unity? It's ikad. The scripture literally says, the Lord, our God, the Lord is unity. The Lord, our God, the Lord is harmony. The Lord, our God, the Lord is oneness of several parts functioning together. This is amazing if you think about it because this indicates that God is essentially a beautiful relationship, not a solitary isolation. In fact, you could say it this way. God has never, ever, ever, ever been alone even before you and I existed. Not a solitary human being anywhere in existence at some point. Remember, we went back, back, back before all of our birth dates, and back before the birth dates of our great, 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 totally great grandpa and grandma, Adam and Eve. And before there were any humans, 
and before there were any angels, listen, we are face to face with the sublime reality of God and God alone, and in the next nanosecond, we realize, hey, wait a minute, God was never actually alone. God has never experienced anything like being alone in a bathroom with a full-length mirror. God has never experienced anything like loneliness or isolation because God has always existed as ikad or compound unity or relationship. Now check this out. Back in the Genesis account of creation, just let this blow your brains out the back of your head. This is going to be so fun what we're about to realize. You're going to be peeling your brains off the far wall right now. Okay, this is fun. This is fun stuff. Watch this. You're looking for the word one again in Scripture, and it's talking about the union of the man and the woman in marriage in the first account of marriage in the Genesis account. And in Genesis 2.24, it says, for this reason, a man, that's a solitary self, right? Yes or no? That's an individual. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That's another solitary self, an individual we might call it, right? And they shall become, what does it say? One flesh. Take a guess. Which word is used there for one? Is it yakid, singularity, or ikad, compound unity? Well, it's ikad. It has to be compound unity because in the text, how many, if you just count them up, how many people? One, two, you can count them. But those two are what? One, in some mysterious sense, the two are one. In the Hebrew way of thinking, in the ancient Hebrew way of thinking, two individuals experience in marriage something called zimzam. Zim, say zim, it's a fun word to say, so let's say it together. Say zimzam. Zimzam, not zoom zoom, zimzam. It's like zoom zoom, but it's zimzam. Now, zimzam, this is a fabulous idea. Zimzam is, listen, the space between the two individuals where individuality is honored. Okay, there's Ty and there's Sue. But Sue has her individuality, and Ty has his individuality, and watch this. Things get really good when Ty, in his individuality, voluntarily gives himself to Sue under no compulsion. And Sue gives herself to Ty voluntarily, uncoerced, because she wants to. Are you tracking with me? That's the most beautiful thing that ever occurs in the world. Where two human beings voluntarily, under no force, give themselves entirely to another. And Zimzam is the space between in which Ty says to Sue, we're one and yet I'm going to allow for your individuality to flourish in relation to mine. And Sue says, we're one, but I'm not going to snuff out your individuality for mine. I'm going to let your individuality flourish in relation to mine. The moment in any marriage where somebody, one of the two, begins to exert coercion, even emotional coer coercion, the moment force is exert exerted, what happens? The natural emotional Inclination is for the one who's being coerced to do what? Back up and to create more space until finally all of the emotional sense of love is killed in the soul. In other words, say it like this, love and force are mutually exclusive and can't occupy the same emotional space. That's how it works. I heard a radio program in which a husband and wife were being interviewed and the, the, the guy who was interviewing them say, hey, hey, you seem to have a good marriage. What makes it so good? I mean, do you go by the biblical text that says the two shall be one? And the lady quickly said, yeah, 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 that's how it's so good. The two shall be one, and I'm the one. Okay, that's not what the text is talking about. It's talking about the two remaining distinct and yet voluntarily given. That's what the Bible calls love. That's what the Bible calls love. 
love. And that's the kind of oneness that the Shema talks about. So Jesus comes into the world, okay, and when he comes into the world, he takes this Old Testament idea that's in the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, compound unity. And Jesus comes along and says, hey, just so y'all know who I am and where I came from, I and my Father are what? One. Well, there's two of us, but we're what? One. We're one. So again, let's press our question. Let's press our question. What was God doing before all of creation, for all eternity past? Well, a series of really brief snapshots of what God was doing before creation. The voice speaking here in Isaiah 42, verse 1, in your outline, I want you to circle a key word here. Watch this. This is God the Father singing a song about his son Jesus before Jesus will come to the world to be the savior of mankind. This is what's called a messianic prophecy. It's foretelling the coming of the Messiah. And the one who's doing the foretelling is the Father. The Father, this is beautiful to think about it, the Father is singing a song about Jesus. And here's what he sings. God the Father says, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, the one I've chosen, in other words, for this task to save you human beings, my elect one, in whom my soul, what's that word? Say it out loud delights. The one in whom my soul delights. Do you like the word delight? It's one of my favorite words. I want you to just pause right now and think about somebody in whom you find delight. Your goldfish doesn't count. Your dog doesn't count. Maybe your dog, definitely not your cat. Okay? But you think of someone right now, a human being, a grandson, a granddaughter, a friend that you've known for years and years and years, a husband, a wife, a nana, a papa. I don't know who it is for you, but think of somebody that energizes you when you're with, you just, you're just happier when they're around. No matter what way they're around. I mean, there's somebody, I mean, we fall in love with people, don't we? We fall in, think of somebody that you'd be happy to be on a 500 mile, no, a thousand mile road trip with them and it's just better because they're with you. Even if they're unconscious most of the time, just laying over there slobbering on themselves. You're like, man, life's good. Life's good just having you slobber right next to me. I just love you. Is there anybody for you in whom your soul delights? And when you get that picture, think about it. God the Father is saying to us, hey, I'm sending you my son, and I want you to know who he is to me. I like him a lot. He's the one in whom I take a lot of pleasure. And I'm parting with him in order to save you. This is in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. And this is again the Father. The prophet is telling us that the Father is describing the Son, Jesus, coming into the world, and it's a prophecy. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my what? What's that word? Companion. This is a prophecy about Jesus coming to the world, going to the cross, hence the symbolism, awake, O sword. A sword is an implement of execution. Jesus will come to the world, and he will suffer and die. And the Father says, that the sword of justice will be awakened against the one who is my companion, my friend. The King James Version says, my fellow. Is there a friendship that lies at the foundation of reality? Before all of creation? Apparently so. This is now a snapshot of Jesus before his incarnation as personified wisdom in the book of Proverbs, describing his relationship with the Father. Now watch this. Jesus, we just read two texts where the Father's describing the Son. Now we're reading where the Son is describing the Father. Are you with me? And the Son says of the Father, I, that's Jesus, was beside him, the Father, 
as a master craftsman. Apparently, they're going to embark upon creation. And I was, I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Now, a moment ago, I asked you to think of someone in whom you take delight. Do you remember that? But now flip it in your mind. You thought of someone in whom you delight. Now I want you to think of someone that you know delights in you. I mean, it's one thing to like someone, but isn't it incredible when you like someone and they like you back? When that doesn't happen, it's miserable. That's why high school was so terrible. High school was just a string of relationships in which I like you with the hope that there would be a reciprocation of like, and inevitably there wasn't. The best thing that can ever happen to a human being is to love someone and to be loved back. And the most excruciating thing that can happen to a human being is to love someone and to not be loved back. Am I telling the truth tonight? It's a painful moment right now to realize that. And yet, through the pain, we're comprehending the beauty of God's character. Jesus says, the Father delights in me. What a great thing to know that you're loved. The New English Bible translates the same text with these words. I was daily, I was at his side each day, his darling and his delight, check this out, playing continually in his presence. This is probably the first time in your whole life, if you've even read the Bible, if you are biblically, if you're a Bible scholar, this is probably the first time in your life that you've ever encountered the idea of the word play associated with God. God, according to Scripture, is a kind of God who plays. Well, that shouldn't surprise us because a moment ago we discovered that God is childlike and eternally young. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to finally encounter God face to face? It's not going to be an austere encounter. We're not going to come groveling up to a, a throne with a God who points his finger with condemnation and issues commands. When we encounter God, according to Scripture, the first thing that's going to happen, this is in the Gospel of Luke, when we first get to the other side of this horror that we've all endured, the first thing that will happen, according to Jesus, is that God the Father himself will have prepared a table, will wrap an apron around his waist, and serve dinner to all of us. God will according to Jesus. Now, that's a picture of God. And finally, in the New Testament, Jesus describes where he came from. He says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, Jesus, he's referring to himself, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So if you were to ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, you just landed in the world. You're here now. You were just born of Mary in Bethlehem. You're all grown up now. Where'd you come from? What's your point of origin? He's not going to say Kansas. What's your point of origin, Jesus? The bosom of the Father. What's that mean, the bosom of the Father? Obviously, it's symbolic, right? I understand back in the 1950s, it was common for men to refer to one another as bosom buddies. Sounds a little weird to me, but anyways. Bosom buddies, what does that mean? I have guy friends. I don't want them anywhere near my bosom. <laughs> right? This is symbolic. It's symbolic of what? Affection, friendship, intimacy. Jesus says, I'll tell you where I came from. Before I was in this world, before I came here to live among you as your Savior, I was in intimate friendship with the Father. We were tight. And then asked Jesus, so what were you and the Father doing before you came to this world? Even before the world was made. 
In John 17, 24, this is mind-blowing, Jesus says to the Father in prayer, we're just overhearing the prayer, Jesus says, Father, you loved me when? Say it out loud, everybody, when? Before the foundation of the world. Hey, Jesus, what were you and the Father doing for all eternity past? You remember our question? What was God doing for all eternity past? Hey, Jesus, what were you doing? What's his answer? We were loving each other. We were friends. We were delighting in one another. We were engaged in a constant, outgoing, other-censored relationship. That's what we were doing. And we're invited in to that. Jesus says, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. And in that same prayer, our final text, circle in your underline these key words. In John 17, 21, Jesus prays to the Father about you and me. Jesus prays, check this out, he prays that they, just put your name there, put my name, us, human beings, he prayed that they, Father, please, that they might be, what's the word? One, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Just as we are one, verse 22. Father, he's still praying, verse 24. I desire that they also, whom you have given me, put your name there, may be with me where I am. This is going to sound silly, I know, but I'm just going to say it. That is one of my top three favorite words in the English language, the word with. Say the word, say with. Isn't it a great word? Don't you like being with people? Don't you like being with people? Don't you not like not being with people? Every time I'm not with people, you know what I want to be? With people. It's a great thing to be with. And Jesus says that he wants you and me to be what? With him. Why? For what purpose? Huh. Then he closes with this. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me, and I have declared to them your name. I've been teaching and proclaiming the gospel, the good news of your love to them, Father, and I've declared to them your name, your character, and I will keep declaring it. Watch this. That, or so that, or in order that, are you tracking with me? Don't miss it. This is the punchline. That they, that the love with which you, Father, have loved me may be in them and I in them. Wow. Jesus, do you know what he's praying for here? He's praying that other-centered, self-giving, beautiful friendship Love will be restored to all of our hearts and lives and that we would all be re-inducted into the fellowship that exists between the Father and the Son and the Spirit by implication, the Holy Spirit. The plan of salvation isn't merely about getting us out of hell into heaven. It's about getting us back into love out of selfishness. The plan of salvation, before it gets us into heaven, gets heaven into us. And to get heaven into us, Jesus came into the world and he's invited us into the love that exists between the Father. So here's what we've learned tonight in three basic parts. Number one, we've learned that God is a social unit of other-centered bliss. That's who and what God is. God is love. Love is other-centered. God is other-centered social interaction. Number two, we've learned that God is infinitely mature and eternally young in friendship. That God's innocent. That God's childlike in his innocence. And number three, we've learned that God is 
the epicenter, the source of all self-giving passion. Here's the promise of the biblical story to you and me. The whole Bible is basically saying this. If you connect up with Jesus, the Savior of the world, He will restore your life on all levels, and you will begin to love again the way you were created to love. The promise of the biblical story is the restoration of God's love in all of our relationships with one another and in our relationship with God. What an invitation. The most beautiful place I've ever been in the world was that place called the Blue Room, surrounded with laughing children who were so elated to just introduce that place to me. Not only was the place beautiful, but everybody who goes there is beautiful. Everybody who comes back to the heart of God becomes beautiful. That's the invitation of Scripture. And what a beautiful invitation that is. Amen? Uh, um, <clears throat> before we conclude with a word of prayer and invite you to share some of the lovely refreshments that have been provided, uh, we want to be able to give away a couple of gifts, just as we did last night. Uh, tonight, we have uh, similar gifts as we did last night. One is a beautiful piece of artwork. It's a picture of Jesus here by Nathan Green. And then uh, we also have this st set of study guides called Truth Link that is put out by Ty Gibson and the Light Bearers Ministry. So we're going to uh, pick a couple of winners from the registration sheets that have been filled out, the registration forms. And yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to mix them up, mix them all up. You know what I mean? Oh, is oh there, there are there's more. more. Oh. Oh, wow. There's more. Let's, let's work this out. All right. So yeah, um, as you come, oh, wow, there's plenty more. All right, pass them in towards the middle if you can. Pass them in towards the middle. Yeah, he can't levitate. Yeah. <laughs> Any others down this way? Yeah, please. Just pass them in towards the middle here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Mm. All right, eager, eager we are, yes. All right, so each night there will be an opportunity to win. Um, they gotta be mixed up though, right? That's true, that's true. And this actually will include registration forms if you fill it, fill them out the previous night. Um, so there may be a There's number one. Here we go. And this will be the winner of the artwork, Nathan Green's artwork. And that is Christine Sitimurang. Am I saying that right? Christine? Yeah? Awesome. All right. Come on up. Come on up. Ty, maybe can you help me out deliver that? Thank you. <clears throat> and our next I guess winner. since you're first, you get to choose, right? Choose these, choose these, choose these. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. Good choice. Sure. Okay. All right. And our second gift will be given to... Oh, wow. That's incredible. I, I believe you're related. Edwin? Is that right? Okay. Edwin Sitamarang. All right. Is that right? <laughs> wow. wow. Nicely done. That's perfect. So if Nicely she wants done. this, you guys can trade. Cool. So last night we had two winners on this side. This, uh, tonight, two winners on this side. Yep. You'll just have to pick an, another side tomorrow. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. And then again, you're invited to share some time with us over some food. Great God. Wow, when it, now as I, as I call upon you as God, Elohim, beautiful relationship that you are. I just thank you so much for revealing to us this picture of an ancient love that you are inviting us into. And as we saw that prayer of Jesus in John 17, Lord, I just simply pray that you would answer that prayer. God, it is your desire to, to cause us to be lifted out of the selfishness that we are steeped in and to be inducted into this beautiful oneness with God. We pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that that promise, that that picture would be our testimony, would be our experience. And we pray that uh, between now and tomorrow night, you would keep us and guard us and that we would make it back safely to study once again together. In Jesus' name, amen.